In February 2020, I was spending a lot of time in New York City's Chinatown, helping out at an exhibition about the protests in Hong Kong. Coronavirus was in the news, but it wasn't hanging directly over us. We were thinking about it a lot, but we were laughing at ourselves for being so neurotic. As the show wound down, the COVID situation in Hong Kong got scary. Masks were collected to send back to activists there. A few months later, with PPE shortages filling the news and hospitals overwhelmed, Hong Kongers would be organizing fundraisers to send masks back to us. During deinstall, I wondered if I could catch the virus from sitting on the floor of the gallery, and I joked about being ready to spend less time in Chinatown. By the end of March, I knew two new things. One, my paranoia about COVID had been legitimate, and two, my joke about Chinatown had been racist. In April, as COVID spread through New York, increasing reports of violence against Asian people made it even clearer how thoughtless and dangerous that joke had been and how many other people were making it. In Maria Hernandez Park in Bushwick, a man pointed at my mask and hissed, stupid. On the same day, on the same walk, another man came up close behind me and whispered, bitch, I'm gonna cut you. Okay, so neither of these things are particularly abnormal in the city, and that's just the reality of living here. But now, because of COVID, I'm wondering if I'm being harassed as a woman or if I'm being harassed as an Asian person specifically. Less ambiguous, in Boston, a group of teenagers scream about coronavirus and refuse to get into the elevator at Copley Mall with my mom. On Instagram, I post a story about all of these things, and I get some sympathy and some criticism. Somebody sends me this article with the message, thoughts? This is Zuccotti Park, and it looks very Christmassy and very clean right now. And during Occupy Wall Street, it was definitely not clean. Occupy was exciting and traumatic. The commitment to leaderlessness and non-hierarchy meant that one day you could be brand new, taking notes at the edge of a working group meeting, and the next day you could be facilitating the meeting. Occupy is criticized for good reasons, but it has also resonated down through many of the movements that would follow, and it always amazes me how many people I meet in activist circles who tell me that they were there. Once a group of us were sitting right here on the ground while we waited for a march to start. A policeman walked up very close to us, and he just kind of stood there. He had positioned himself near a young woman sitting on the ground so that his crotch was hovering just inches away from the back of her head and he was staring down and swaying back and forth in a kind of erotic stupor. After we'd all silently signaled to each other that this was actually happening, somebody said something and he popped out of his haze and muttered, I let you guys stay here. I didn't make you move. And having reminded us of how generous he'd been, he walked away. The second incident I want to share is from the night of the raid. On November 15th, 2011, I got on the train to Brooklyn, and right as we reached the other side of the bridge, I received a call that the NYPD was moving in on the park. So I got off at the next station and got right on a train heading back. Texts poured in, saying that the cops were tearing down tents, throwing library books into a dumpster, and arresting people en masse. When I got out of the station, the streets were blocked on both sides by police lines. I couldn't get back to the park, and I ended up in front of a crush of people somewhere near Cortland Street. There was a wall of NYPD facing us, shoving people back step by step with their riot shields, and what I remember most about them is how hyped up and excited they were for this opportunity to kick our asses. We had nowhere to go when they screamed to back up, and talking to them just enraged them. They started throwing punches and grabbing people out of the crowd, wrestling them into police vans. In the chaos, I avoided arrest by running cross town towards the East River, when the group I was with scattered after being shot with pepper spray. We hid on a side street and then moved uptown under the FDR, avoiding police until we met with others for an emergency dawn meeting at Foley Square. We were allowed back to the park later, but the books had been ruined, computers were missing or destroyed, and tents had been slashed and dumped. Some items were mysteriously soaked, like they'd been sprayed down with a fire hose. People continued to organize and meet after the eviction from the park, but my participation in Occupy ended when I caught a brutal respiratory virus that would become known as Zuccotti lung. 
I was sick for over a month and my lungs have never been the same. I thought about that a lot this year when an Occupy City Hall sprung up. I saw those tents and the crowds of young people cramped together and I felt afraid for everybody involved. We didn't even have a COVID epidemic back then and Occupy almost killed me. But I guess we didn't all have masks either. And as far as I know, Occupy City Hall didn't have a working group specifically charged with rolling cigarettes, so that probably helps. Anyway, in all of the months I worked at Occupy, I don't know if I ever thought about being Asian American, except for little moments of being annoyed with some white man or other for assuming that he was in charge. My racial identity did not feel central to my experience of that movement, and it didn't affect how I chose to participate. BLM is completely different. When George Floyd was murdered at the end of May 2020, and Black Lives Matter movements exploded newly across the country, it suddenly felt weird to share a post about racism against Asian Americans when black friends were posting videos of people being gunned down or suffocated by the police. Both things are terrible, and both fall under the broad umbrella of racially motivated violence. There's undeniable intersection in these issues, but they have different histories and different implications. On the one hand, I could understand why some Asian Americans would resent the lack of popular interest in the violence against us. It felt like yet another example of our chronic social invisibility. On the other hand, I could see why someone like the writer of that article would feel insulted by any demand that they should show up for our community when they felt that their own had been under attack for all of American history. Today, words that used to feel useful seem trite and insufficient. Terms like ally, intersectionality, minority, solidarity. And at the same time, terms like anti-racist have become sharper, describing not just an attitude, because of course we all think that we are anti-racist, but an ideological and behavioral model requiring continual self-interrogation and intentional action. It took me a while to put aside my terror of COVID and attend BLM protests. For the first week, I lied to myself that I could contribute remotely, but as someone on my Facebook wall put it when I expressed these hesitations, us black people don't have the luxury of choosing safety. And I watched videos of Hong Kongers showing up day after day and month after month despite COVID. So you go. By June 2020, I was unemployed thanks to COVID and volunteering for a progressive newspaper. On one particular day, we were handing out newspapers as protesters came over the bridge from Brooklyn and headed towards City Hall. It was the first time in a while that I'd been back there. In the crowd, I saw young people who reminded me of the original occupiers, but there were key differences. Unlike Occupy, the BLM marches I've attended have had prominent leaders and visible central organizers who will introduce themselves as such. While Occupy stressed autonomous action, at BLM events, we are encouraged to wait for the instructions of black leaders and to fill needs or take on active roles only when explicitly asked by people most affected by the issues at hand. This movement feels less horizontal and inclusive, but it also feels more focused and effective. That day, I walked two stacks of newspapers over the Brooklyn Bridge, from one wave of protesters that had already crossed the bridge and arrived at City Hall to another that was just heading west towards the bridge from central Brooklyn. But because I was between the two waves of marchers, the bridge was almost empty for my entire walk. The Brooklyn Bridge has been the site of dramatic episodes in both Occupy and BLM. On October 1st, 2011, almost 700 protesters were arrested when they were allowed to proceed into the traffic lanes by police before being cut off from both exits and funneled into an arrest trap. In July 2020, multiple protesters in NYPD were injured when a confrontation between a pro-police march and an Occupy City Hall march ended in a brawl. 37 people were arrested. In September, the bridge was occupied by hundreds of protesters in response to the verdict in the Breonna Taylor case. There were no arrests that night. At some BLM protests, there has been a phenomenon of white allies creating a defensive line between the police and BIPOC protesters, the idea being that they can use their privilege to defend those most likely to be targeted or hurt. 
So maybe you're Asian American like me. I enjoy the benefits of what's sometimes described as white adjacency, but I have also been made at times to feel invisible, an other or a foreigner in my own country. Our communities are often underserved by the justice system, but we are also far less likely to be unjustly targeted by its violence. Sure, I felt at times that my inclusion in majority white workplaces or social circles is tenuous and conditional, but I've never worried that I wasn't hired because of my race. I've experienced police violence firsthand, but ultimately I have no fear that a cop will feel empowered to kill me specifically because I am Asian. Or maybe you are nothing like me. After all, our label includes both the highest earning and the lowest earning groups in the country. It includes Korean Americans and Indian Americans and Vietnamese Americans, multiple waves of unrelated immigrations over centuries whose cultures, experiences, and struggles may have almost nothing in common. Since that's the case, I'm not sure I can provide an Asian American perspective. I don't really know what it means. So you're at a Black Lives Matter protest. An organizer shouts, defend this space. White people move to the front, acknowledgement of a shared privilege. Black, indigenous, and people of color move to the defended area, acknowledgement of a shared experience of violence. Where do you stand? <laughs> 